Before I get started, I do realise I didn't put my name on the front on the front slide, as has been already mentioned. I am uh, David Chubb. I'm a project engineer for Network Rail and uh, Buildings and Civils, but uh, actually in my background, civil engineering as a degree, but actually my dissertation was in trap bed design. And for a little while, I was uh, I worked in uh, the maintenance uh, team in Samwell and Dudley. So still quite fairly varied in my experience and knowledge, but predominantly the reason it's called how to solve a problem like crew is there was going to be more than just the drainage. But then I started laying out all the problems we have with the drainage and realized, yeah, everything comes back to water. So without further ado, very quickly, the project I'm talking about at the moment is the first project as part of Crew Programme. So Crew Programme, big set of works that are going to happen over the next decade and a half and probably beyond. And the first one through is the Bassford Hall resignalling. Um, on the uh, slide in, uh, that you can see there, the bottom right hand side is Grand Junction itself, the junction north of Crew station then you've got the station and the Bassett Hall independent lines were the bypass route built by L and WR uh, for the freight and it takes their name from Bassford Hall which is a little hall to the southwest of Crew Station that's about as much as I'm going to talk about specifically what we're going to do in, in all because in order to explain to you what we're really doing we've got nine and a half kilometers of drainage which is the largest single amount of drainage to be done on any railway project by Network Rail at this moment in time. As far as I know, if someone has one that's bigger, please do let me know. But as far as I'm aware, this is the largest one. The only one that beats it is HS2. It's the only one that beats it. It's a lot of drainage. Why do we need drainage? Yeah, that's why. That was a few years ago. It does this every year, at least once. Oh, and it also does this as well. I want you to keep this picture in mind. So this is the low point in the middle of what we are going to call Network 4 underneath the bridge that you can see there, which is the Chester, which is the Shrewsbury lines south leading a southwest out of crew. Um, yeah, that's up to my hip. Those are the independents. Those are the independents. Yes, that was a couple of years ago during um, a lot of snow. And you can see that they, it's not the cleanest of water because, of course, we are a D, well, predominantly diesel freight yard, even though we're fully electrified. So Bassford Hall, a little bit of a history. Without understanding what our problems are going to give you, we really need to understand the history first. So Grand Junction Railway, reason we're all here. They decided to run a railway through crew. They couldn't run it through Nantwich because Nantwich had money and said no. They couldn't run it through Winsford because Winsford had money and said no. So they ran it through a patch of, patch of land that had nothing in it other than Crew Hall. And that's why it, where it took its name from. Originally, it was a four-track railway. The station was not where it is now. It was slightly further north. It was all north of Nantwich Road Bridge. And it was a low-lying area in the top of the Winsford River and Weaver River Basin. Nothing really much to note. However, quite quickly, it start, they were, they, when uh, GJR started, they had a realisation that they could be the first proper trunk railway in the UK. They, that was what their first real ambition was. Hence, you can notice that e their ambitions were quite obvious early on because it was a full trap railway with two fast through lines through crew. So you can already see that they quite started quite early. Now, what's important to note here is that there are two low points in this area, and they're not really low. The whole area is quite flat. Gresty Brook and Valley Brook. Those are our two protagonists, and Gresty Brook is probably the one that's going to take the most of a battering. So, Crew Station then, LNWR come in. They've amalgamated with GJR and a bunch of others, and they come in and they build the station that we actually know today in 1867. They only had two bay platforms at the point in time. Um, which at uh, our present day platform one through platform 11. Uh, the buildings in the mid, uh, those lovely sandstone, uh, stand, sand, uh, sandstone buildings in the middle of those bay platforms, that's when they're from. They're the only listed part of Crew Station. Um, now, the LSL siding started life as a good shed for horse landing, one of the reasons it's called horse landing. 
and basically David, we seem to have lost sound. How's that? Yep, can hear you again. Brilliant. Don't know what happened there. I didn't touch anything. Um, where was I when I stopped talking? Horse landing, David. Horse landing. I got to horse landing. Brill. So horse landing had its origin. Had its origin. Uh, 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 that's where it came from. In that area was that was where all the goods came in and the livestock, and also where people with not so nice horses stabled them when they went and get on the train to go away. Come up, give the horse, pop it in a stable, go away for a little while, come back, pick up the horse when you get back. So sewage systems. So uh, Basil Jet came along in the 1850s. This is the bit that the people on the call missed uh, and properly solved the cholera epidemic in London, at which point modern sewage was born. Um, how you get your poo from your bottom out to a place where it's nowhere near your nose or your mouth or the water that you drink from. Quite important. And the problem we've got here is that this is the point that crew starts actually building a sewage system. Ah, no one really knows how they do sewage at this point in time. We've got a very flat, fairly marshy land. So we've started putting. Lost you again, David. Oh. Not quite. Oh. Not quite sure what's going on there. I can hear you again. Yeah, not quite sure what's going on there. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, so the uh, if we need to, I'll just switch onto the computer audio. Um, so if that happens again, I'll switch onto computer audio. I do apologise, everyone. Next time it happens, let me know. Um, so basically, the first pipes that come in are cast iron pipes. We know this because we find them, and we keep finding them at the moment in Bassford Hall because we keep trying to put signals in grounds where we don't think there's anything in the ground. The signalling team go out, dig a trial pit, and go. There's a pipe here. And you go. Does it do anything? Well, it's made of cast iron. Ah. That's probably the Victorian drainage. It's not doing anything anymore. But the first indication that crew's probably going to be quite wet. And then the independent lines come along. They are really late. Basically, there's a lot of traffic goes through crew at this point in time. And LNWR go to the government and say. Just you again. Right, we're going to try and do it with the computer audio. Is that okay? Yep. Perfect. Right, do apologise for whatever reason the mic has lost all power and is low on battery. Um, we've, uh, I've been informed it was charged. Yeah. Um, so hopefully this works. If you can't hear me again, then please do let me know. Right, so let's go back. 
So, independent lines come along in 1895. Uh, really late. Basically, crews gotten too busy for LNWR and they need a lot more. So they come along, they build the third bay platform, the ones that we currently don't use and want to re bring back in as part of crew program for the second time. Um, and it was completed in 1901. And basically these were a set of lines that wasn't have, that wasn't a ballast yard, that wasn't basket hall sidings as they currently stand. It was just two tracks that go off to the left, that turn off just below Batley Road and come under the West Coast Main Line, straight under the bottom of Grand Junction, north of Crew Station. So what happened there? So we built this lovely bridge. This is the original drawing back from the uh, eight, eight, back from uh, 1901. Uh, it's not really a bridge. It's not really a tunnel. It's a tunnel now. It's called about it's an independent lines tunnel. At the time, it was just called a bridge. It wasn't as long as it is now. It's got extended periodically through its life. And all it was was some wrought iron girders on top of some brick. That was all. That's all it was. Come back to the tunnel in a minute. And then the independent lines, again, carrying on that trend from um, the Victorians. They need drainage, so they put vitrified clay pipes throughout the side. Cast iron's old now. It's a ton of pipe everywhere. Large pipes at that. They're not small 250, the 400 mil, a lot of these. And not only that, but they have pipes even bigger than that, ones that we're currently still finding out about. They're all shallow pipe gradients. They didn't really go downhill very quickly. But since they got installed, Bassford Hall got built. The sheds got built. The engine works got built. The railway shifted on top of it. That is what the drainage looked like. I know it's not very easy to tell, but on there you can see that when they came along a little bit later and started building up Bassford Hall, there's a ton of these massive cross-track UTXs for carrying drains all across Bassford Hall. There's a really long culvert, it's called Gresty Brook, straight through the middle of that screen. It's not very easy to tell, but basically this was, there is a lot of drainage pipes on that drawing. And a lot of them are still in the ground today. So we're currently in the middle of a history about Bassford Hall. Let's talk about a history within a history. Let's talk about Gresty Brook. So Gresty Brook, very, very important. And something that is really important to note is crew to Stafford, the railway goes over the UK's continental divide. Everything in crew goes into the Irish Sea. Everything in Stafford goes into the North Sea. You couldn't tell when you're on the train, can you? It's the commute that I take every single day. But what that means is that actually there's a, we're on a very, very flat piece of land. As you can see on the relief map on the right hand side, we're really not very far above sea level. We're only 50 metres above sea level, which is really not very high, considering we're right next to the edge of the watershed for the Mersey. Everything goes into the Mersey where we are here in Crewe. That's really important to note. That means that there's a lot of streams, a lot of brooks because the land is so flat. That is Gresty Brook. And if you see the image on your right, the. Uh, this line here, if it lets me draw it, it's not going to let me draw it. You can see it wiggling through the countryside, straight through the middle of that grey photo. That's Gresty Brook. That's what it was used to. That's what it was there for. We put a big railway on the top of it and then built crew on top of it. That's what it looked like. When we built the first railway, that's what it looked like when we built Bassford Hall on top of it, on the, built the independent lines on top of it. That's what it looked like when we expanded the independent lines. That's what it looked like after the modernization plan. That's what it looks like now. Yeah. What that means is that Gresty Brook does not look the same. On the left, and I realise I do apologise, the photos are a bit off, got a lovely brick culvert, which surcharges at least once a year. That surcharge means it gets full of water. And then this is the bottom end, the bit that got built most recently. 
straight underneath the ballast handling, well, not under, part, the, the, the sidings to the west of the ballast handling yard, as it is now. They went in and said, oh, we're going to build a bunch of stuff on top of this culvert, dug it up and rebuilt it back in 2009. Quite nice of them. It's the only bit that's actually fit for purpose, really. And even then, it's probably not big enough. And the other thing to note as well is there used to be a lovely set of um, tracks that used to go from that used to take trains from the south to the east towards Stoke. The bridge got removed uh, about 60, 50 years ago. And this image doesn't show it, but there is a lovely pump house there. Again, this area likes to flood. This piece of railway in particular, they knew like to flood, so they put a pump in there to throw it to th get the water out of this lovely little sump that, in effect, we'd built in this location. So nothing really much changed to the uh, uh, that culvert's changed a lot during its life. But one of the first things that is very interesting to note is 2008. There was an oil spill. It's not meant to look like that, people. Uh, um, and that was the first time the EA started enacting some of its powers that it had recently had from not that long before. And the first time that they came along and said, Network Rail, I'm going to find you here in Crimp. So that was for the Areva depot. And the Areva depot now has some interceptors built in it, oil interceptors, nice big tanks to make sure the oil doesn't end up in the water stream. And just to point out, quite how much this brook gets used. These are basically all the inlets going through it, and there are far more than the shown on here. There's tons of them. We don't know what they're all there for. We don't have time to find out what they're all for. The maintainers don't know what they're all for either. We don't have the time, a lot of them are silted up. And this is where the problem starts to come with us. You'll start to hear me say the word silted up a lot around crew. That they put clay pipes in, that's a shallow gradient. That's what it looks like now. It's not a nice straight line. It wiggles, it bends. It's not the same construction the whole way through. And we've somehow got to fit into it because that is where our water goes. That is the bit where we give our water to Cheshire East Council because at that point, it's their responsibility. Because we have to give it to them, we have responsibility about what it needs to look like on the other side. So back out of the Gresty Brook, a little bit of a history. The British Rail Modernisation Plan comes through in 1960 and they electrify the entire area. I'm not going to say this is where it all starts to go wrong. I mean, it definitely is where it starts to go wrong. During the modernisation plan, the British Rail appear to have gone, hmm, this area floods and replace a lot of the drainage that was there with spun steel. Fun fact, steel rusts. Um, so, but what we discovered is they didn't replace all of them. They replaced some of them. And we don't know which ones they replaced. There's no record. We do have some drainage plans for the area and we do know that they acknowledge that they have a problem, but that's it. That's all I've got to go on from the archives that we now have. The archives pre-1990 probably would have been a bit better, but we are in the situation that we are now, which is the fact that we put everything in a bin in the 90s and then tried to put it all online in the early noughties. So I don't have much to go on other than the network rail. And I'm quite young. I'm not very long out of university. So all I've got to go on is talking to people and what's in our archive. So here is part of that drainage design. It's not particularly obvious, um, but basically through here are a series of notes about how, where they want to replace the drains, what the fall is going to be, and so on and so forth. And it helps us try and work out where the current stuff is today. And then we come back to the tunnels. This is what the drainage apparently looks like through the tunnels. It's not what it looks like through the tunnels, but it's almost what it looks like through the tunnels. And what you'll notice is Valley Brook goes straight underneath the bottom of that tunnel. That's how much we built crew up. We built it wasn't flat before. It was flat for ge geological perspective, but for a railway, it wasn't. It was bumpy and it was hilly. Valley Brook's ten meters down. Gresty Brook's seven meters down. These are deep, deep culverts because we tried to put a railway over the top, and that's why we could put a tunnel under the railway and it still be higher 
than Valley Brook is, which goes straight underneath these tunnels. So everything in this area that goes into the tunnels all goes into Valley Brook. What you'll notice, though, is you know how I said that they electrified the area? What's above the tunnels is North Crewe. Lovely track people don't want to have to start increasing the rail height of an entire junction. Can't blame them. So instead, they lowered the track. Now, this area is in a cutting with some big retaining walls and goes through a tunnel. So they put struts in underneath the railway, which we didn't know about. Well, did, but we didn't know about at the start of the project. And if you notice in here, they've got lovely pipes underneath these struts. Come back to this in a minute. Then we have 2003 Murphy's come along. At least the records show it's Murphy's. I don't actually have a lot to go on other than a little pencil drawing from uh, optioneering stage from this project. But we know it went in. So they came along trying to fix that problem at the beginning, that problem that we saw where the hole, the water was coming up to my hip, trying to solve that problem. And I'm aware that there might be some people on this call that know this project team, so I'm going to hold my tongue. But this is what this is what the attempt was to put, put in, and this is the first time that we find plastic twin wall pipes. It's quite odd. There was a massive gap. That's the point where we start to find twin wall plastic pipes going in everywhere with modern catch bits with the blue grids, except they come later with concrete lids, concrete risers. Come back to this in a minute as well. Didn't work. 2010 flooding prevention also came on. Another attempt in a slightly different place. Which resulted in the mobile pump being put in almost immediately right at the bottom of the system. The maintainer has been having to run that for the last 10 years. It costs a lot to have to go out, switch it on to try and drain the area, and it still doesn't do a brilliant job at that. And the maintainer has tried. It'll get us wrong. The amount of effort the maintainer has put in to try and keep crew from being underwater has been unbelievable. Right, that's the history. So Bassford Hall has a problem, a lot of them. 13 to be exact. So problem number one, we've got flat topography. This is the track alignment through the area. Now, don't be tricked by the fact it's quite a nice um, diagonal line. That's actually quite a really, really long downhill gradient. So we've now got to drain a very, very long area into Gresty Brook, which also, Gresty Brook also isn't at the point of the lowest part of the system. The lowest part of the system is again under those under those bridges that we saw with those lovely up to waist height pictures. Gresty Brook is about 200 to 300 meters. Is it about that? 400 meters up a hill. Come to that in a minute. So fundamentally, what this means is that whatever drainage we're going to have is going to get deep fast. So the designer acknowledged this, split it into six sections to try and make sure that we tried to remove the water from getting the massive pipes really, really, really deep. Quite difficult to do. And there's the relief map of the area. And this is the other problem. You'll note that we're the slowest point of the whole of crew as well. So everything makes our way onto the railway eventually. Problem number two, outfall compliance. Something which the Victorians didn't, it didn't have, something which British Rail technically didn't have, but actually put in oil interceptors in the 1950s. I don't know why. There was no law telling them they had to, but they did. Fantastic. That old interceptor that I found in the records doesn't exist anymore. It got removed, but it was there. It was working for years. But we've got outfall requirements and we've got a ton of regulations. And really, a lot of these have only just arrived recently. And this is one of the problems we're going to have. We can't, we can't use 250 mil pipe, throw it in the cess. Can't do that. It won't work. Too much water to get into Gresty Brook that we can't just throw it in and just go, there you go, Crewies Council, deal with all of our oil. Can't do that anymore because then the EA turns around and goes, hello, Network Rail, here's one million pound fine for every year until you, until you fix the problem. 
guess what? Owen O'Neill doesn't quite like the sound of that. Step three, those struts that I mentioned earlier. Yeah, we didn't know they existed. So the first weekend we went out to go and put the drainage in. Hello, there's some concrete in the ground exactly where we want to put our pipe. So problem number one, uh, problem number three is how do we get under? So again, I come back to this old drawing here. So we at least knew kind of how many struts we had to go and find. That was useful. I'm very glad I found this old archive drawing after we found the struts which had found it before. So how do we deal with this problem? Well, one of the problems that we've got is that when we dug down, we established that actually it wasn't underneath the strut necessarily in all the locations. In some places, the pipe had been cast into the strut. Another problem with these struts, there is a mention of high alumina cement on them. Now, high alumina cement, for those who aren't concrete nuts, is really, really, really bad when you put it in contact with water. It was massive in the 60s, and then we realized it quickly loses strength the moment you expose it to water. So we ended up in this situation where we had, uh, where we're there going, we can't touch these concrete struts. We just can't touch them. I think someone isn't muted. Anyway, the um, so we've got this situation where we have to use the pipes through the struts. Otherwise, we're going to have to go out, start doing pouring tests and all these struts, try and work out what's going on with them and all the rest of it. So we sit there and we go, right, what this means, we have to reuse the existing bit of pipe. So we cut down, dig down, cut out the existing bit of pipe. These are what the struts look like. That's the work site. We had to take the track off because it was really, really, really difficult to construct without it coming off. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the track design for all the track nuts out there. Uh, the designer's currently sat in the room with me, staring me down. Um, and we cut out the pipe, we connect onto the existing bit of pipe, and we pop it in the ground. Now, one of the problems with this, that now has to be a carrier pipe, not a filter pipe. This part of the railway is not draining. That's fine. This is the bit with the highest gradient. The water will make its way into the rest of the filter system in the tunnels, which, thank God, were working. <laughs> if we had to touch the, 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 the drainage in those tunnels, I would not be here now because I would have left. I've gone and taken up um, another career as a gardener. Um, the, so that's one of the problems. So one of the problems we got there now is that we've now got a pipe that's now going to go from this, from one type to another type with numerous junctures in it. That's really not very good for maintenance. So we're getting out a nice liner to go inside. Brilliant. Problem with all of this, we've now reduced the capacity of that pipe because we've now put a five mil liner in that pipe. This pipe, which was already not big enough, isn't big enough. So we had to apply for a derogation on this one, which very kindly, the TA acknowledged that they weren't going to suddenly start making us dig up all these struts and put them back again. So, one thing we did use, though, is the TDS 400s, which this section should know about from a previous presentation that was done. And actually, it was that previous presentation that sparked the idea for these, because one of the problems that we had was we now had, in effect, a dam or a weir underneath the railway. So at the time when we've got a lot of water, because we've got a pipe that's too small, that means the water is going to surcharge in that pipe, push into the rest of the system, and then start spilling out of the system upstream of these struts. You're going to have a lot of water going through the ground, trying to push its way through the ballast out to the other side. Right. How do we deal with this? TDS 400s are meant for uh, are something that can be used for is in effect replacing very small pipes through tunnels where there's not a lot of space you can't push through. So we pop them over the top. In effect, they're not going to do very much. There aren't any calculations to back them up. However, they're there just in case. And hopefully the principle is, is that they'll enable some water to make its way through over the top of the struts without backing up. It's, it's the black thing in the middle. Okay, thank you. It's basically old rubber tires, and it's basically this lovely filter medium that's about that, but that's about an inch wide. It's, a, it's, a it's very, very, very light. Very, very, very light. Yes. And what we did is we laid them end to end, which isn't generally how they're meant to be used. But the idea was was that it's going to be better than trying to put ballast there or sand blanket. But because the sand blanket through this section was going to be about an inch thick anyway. 
because of how high the struts are underneath the bottom of the thing. Not a very good thing from a maintenance point of view. The sand blanket's not going to last very long because of these struts. In fact, we were quite surprised how good the track quality through here was, considering the struts were here. As I said, thank goodness we didn't have to go through the tunnel. That's the one blessing we've had on the project is the drains in the tunnel have been working. Not sure why, but they're the only things that hadn't collapsed over the entire area. Problem number four, who put that there? Lovely game I like to play. Would anyone like to guess what's hiding under the ground in this area? Any telltale signs? Water. Some water, there's definitely water. Um, yeah, no, there's an interceptor. In that 2010 scheme that we were talking about, we didn't realise that they'd put an interceptor in. So Siemens came along and wanted to put an REB in. And then they dug down and uh, we discovered there was an interceptor straight underneath where they wanted to put the REB. Oh, that's a different problem. Right, so we've drained it. We've had a look inside. We know it's not fit for purpose for a modern system. And it's full of stuff in the bottom of it. But what is luckily, though, wasn't very full of oil. That is quite lucky because what it's meant is that we've been able to bypass it temporarily. And the EA have given us the permission to do that. It means we don't have an interceptor for the time being, but we are going to put one in. We're going to fill it with foam concrete. That's going to be a fun job trying to get the concrete hose over all of the uh, Salops Goods Junction South and basically fill it with concrete. And the advantage there at that point is it will have a similar, it will be more strong than the soil that was going to be there in the first place for, uh, for, uh, for the REB. The REB should now not fall through a ground, uh, through a hole into the ground when we discovered the interceptor in about 20 years. Hey, this is why you do ground investigation. Problem number five, who put that there again? Another interceptor. Yay. You know that 2003 scheme that I mentioned to you, the one where we went, yes, it clearly didn't work. This is the interceptor. And you're full of water. And if you have a look in the right hand image, it's not very clear. Um, but currently that is the supply for an entire tree of it. That's its drinking supply at the moment. Um, none of this is working. The uh, the one on the left hand side was the uh, warning box. Then that's meant to warn you when you've got too much oil into the system and you need to clear it out. Yeah, that's broken and no one's been maintaining that. Um, and the other thing is, I then started to look a little bit around the local area. This is us draining it out to have a look to see what it is and work out what it's doing. You know that thing that I showed you not very long ago? Um, you'll see that the black line on the bottom part of this draw drawing shows all the drainage going downhill again. I didn't say this at the beginning. I should have done. Everyone remember the core principle of drainage. Water goes downhill. It's a lot harder than it sounds. So all this water is going downhill against the gradient. And this is one of the key things that we then come up against. This design isn't awful. The gradients aren't quite enough to not make sure they don't silt up. But hey, at least it's going the right way. Except when we got there, I could lean down into the into the six foot and bend my elbow and put my hand up the pipe. That's how shallow these pipes were. They weren't doing anything. They were draining the sleepers and not well, very well at that. And the other thing is they also went downhill. Not to the outfall. And what we think happened is that they made a decision halfway through to reuse a section of drain because what they've clearly done is gone in, replaced just the chamber, put in some plastic pipes and connected them up to play pipes. Very quickly discover that from the CCTV. The problem is, is the bit that all of this system was relying on was collapsed, almost probably collapsed the moment they tried to touch it. This whole thing is just gone underneath that bridge. It's not there. We tried to find it. We tried to blast through. No, there's not even a pipe there anymore. It's gone that much. That's not great news. There's only one other thing to note about this. You'll note where the interceptor is in the system. Even if this had gone in, it wasn't intercepting anything, really. It was intercepting the top half of the system, which is a through line. The, there's still half the system after the interceptor. What happens to the oil that goes into the other half of the system? Again, but at the very least, they're thinking they're trying to put an interceptor in. This is in 2003 when it was only knew that we actually needed to care about our water, really. It was only then that we were starting to have it enforced. 
Problem number six, it can't be that shallow a gradient. So you know how I just pointed at this one and went, oh, look, it's all going downhill. Now, Gresty Brook is to the left. You know how I mentioned it was uphill to get to Gresty Brook? This is the low point in the middle underneath the bridge. Can't be that shallow. So what we discovered later on, much too late in the project, unfortunately, by the time we finally blasted through all of the pipes, we owned, then we only then finally found out what the invert levels were. Problem is, is that we've got to get from this low point to Gresty Brook. Gresty Brook is the orange dot on the left. Our low point is the, where the green line divots in the middle. Somehow, we've got to get from that low point to Gresty Brook, which, because of the existing levels of the pipes, meant that we would have to basically put in a flat system. Now, everybody's seen what happens when you put in a flat system. It's the entire rest of the presentation. Everything silts in seconds. We tried blast. The whole reason it took us so long to find out what these levels were was because we'd go in, blast a section, run out of time, come back a week later to go in and measure the invert levels, and it, it silted again. That's how quickly this happens. Now, very, very bad system because, of course, the bit that we hadn't blasted was full of silt. So that's a bit of an exaggeration of where it is in practice, but still the point stands. So how do we solve this? Well, at the moment, we're currently still trying to be in optioneering, even though we're in delivery, don't ask. And we're going between a gravity fed system, which is the one with the flat pipes, very difficult to lay. Also at very large depth, or we put in a pump. Now, this is something new to the rail industry, but has been around in the drainage industry for donkey's years. If you can't get your water to flow at a, gra at, a, at a state that's going to prevent your pipe from silting, it's an arising main. If we put an arising main, we do away with a lot of the problems, but we have to run a pump. That's where your problem comes in. That's the lovely picture of the pump design. If Neil's on the call, I apologise. I've shared this before it's finished, but it's not finished. But hey ho, it's good enough. And what's good fun about it is you start to realise actually quite how fun drainage is. That really good fun. Problem seven. Who put that there again? That there again. We now have cadent gas main. Gas main. Oh no, under pressure. Got to stay at least a meter away from it when we're digging past it. And guess where it is? It's the red line. Gresty Brooks, the blue line. It's straight in our way. It's also at the depth that our pipes now are. It's about three meters down on the left hand side and about four meters down on the right hand side. That was put in in the 90s. There's the drawing for it. Oh, uh, there it is. That isn't the drawing for it, the one that comes up. Something else is in our way as well. It's the water main for the signal box, which they've just replaced as we're on the project. At least they made it slightly nicer for us in some ways. But all of a sudden, water goes downhill. And unless you're putting it under pressure, it dictates where it goes. And if it's dictating, it needs to go through a pipe that's in the ground to get to the outfall in time. You've got a headache. So. We haven't solved those problems yet, but predominantly what the idea at the moment is because we're going to have to go through them and under the gas main at depth, it's going to have to be cut and cover. It's not it's going to take a lot of time. Because we are running too close to directionally drill or to bore micro tunneling underneath all those fun things. We're too close. No, no tunneling contractor is going to take us up because they can't be certain that they're not going to puncture the gas main, basically. Entirely fair, but a lovely headache when you finally discover it's there. Problem number eight, foundations. You'll note, again, 1960s, they put OLE everywhere and our drains want to go in the ground. Now, this is one of the problems that HS2 is currently trying to avoid, from my understanding. They are trying to make sure that all that, that you can come in and dig up a drainage system in the future. Because under our current railway, no one thought about that when they drew the boundary that long ago, because they didn't even know OLE really existed. So what's the problem there? We've got to go past lots of signals. We've got to go past lots of OLE. We've got to go past lots of loc bases at depth. 
So one of the things that, uh, so the temporary works design has been working off the clock on this project because we've got lots of little niggly sites to deal with. And one of the key things we have to deal with is how to keep the OLE back. Now, this looks a bit crude. And for those who aren't used to reading Sybil's drawings, basically on the drawing on your left, there is an OLE mast. That should be quite obvious. And what's holding it back is a Kentledge block that has been wrapped around the OLE mast with straps. The idea is that the Kentledge block, big massive concrete weight, will in effect replace the soil that's currently holding that pile up. That pile currently wants to rotate in the ground because the OLE is pulling it down. It wants to rotate. You put a Kentledge block in, dig past, it doesn't move. None of them have moved yet. Win. This was, you know, it looks crude, but it's effective and it's simple. Quite a nice little thing to do. And we we nicked it from King's Cross because this is what King's Cross had to do in some locations to go past. We also have to go in a hole. And this is one of the things that actually is quite difficult to now deal with because there's a lot of old rules to do with holes that don't exist anymore, such as the uh, 1.2 meter rule of that's the point you start needing things and uh, start needing protection and all the rest of it. So the problem that we've got here is that we've now got to have a moving construction at depth. Again, this isn't your older track drainage jobs where you dug a little hole just to the bottom of the formation, put in a 250 pipe, put ballast over the top of it, be done with. These are deeper. We're going down to three meters at this point. At that point, it becomes a much larger kettle of fish. So what this means is that we've now got to have trench boxes, we've got to have man boxes, we've got to have shielding for the shallower, more stable stuff. There's a lot to think about with these things and it makes progress slower. It doesn't have to necessarily, but it can make progress slower, especially if you're not used to using it. And why is this important? That's why it's important. Now that isn't a very big rock fall on one of our holes, but it was quite a bit. But actually, if you think about that, this is because we'd established that this was actually a somewhat stable face. If that hadn't been a stable hole, we'd have had what's happened with numerous UTXs throughout history, which is someone's lost their legs or someone's died because they've been buried alive. Holes are dangerous, always dangerous. Mm -hmm. And not only is there the problem of you being buried, there's the problem you fall in. I said it's two meters deep. If you were to walk up a building, stand two meters up and then look down, you'd want a barrier or a railing there. So why aren't we doing it for our holes necessarily? So again, these are the things that are being thought about on Basswood Hall, problems that we're solving, safety things that we're trying to and keep hold of. Surely. Track stability is obviously a big key and we won't talk about something that happened not that long ago. Oh. Um, problem number nine. Hang on, why are the foundations so shallow? 1960s OLE, apparently they didn't know, apparently they didn't work to modern standards. We made the assumption at the beginning of the project that even though they didn't work to modern standards, the OLE foundations would still have to be quite deep. No, 1.5 meters deep. That's nothing for an OLE mass. An OLE mass should be five, six to eight meters deep. It's so these the fact that we discovered they're 1.5 meters deep, all of a sudden the Kentledge block system doesn't work because now there is absolutely no toe keeping that OLE structure in the location it is. And all that's going to happen is you cut out of it and it will just drag the Kentledge block into the hole with it. Oh no, this is right where we need to be at our deepest point. Ah, so what this means is that in order to solve it, going into micro tunneling world again. Hey, love micro tunneling. And yes, this is probably the best design that we've got. This has gone through about a million different iterations. I can't name how many. The uh, CEM on the job has is on holiday at the moment, and I think he's quite glad he's on holiday because he doesn't have to think about this problem anymore. Um, the uh, We've got track in the way, we've got OLE in the way, we've got lopes in the way. We're going at depth, we're next to a building. Suddenly micro tunneling is your cheapest option. Cut and cover just isn't going to cut it anymore because the amount of work that you have to do to make sure nothing falls in that hole is horrible. 
Running sand! Yay! As if life couldn't get any harder. For those who don't know, running sand is basically when you find sand that's got more water in it than it should normally carry. And if you go on a beach and uh, you just walk down to the shoreline and you try and pick up the sand in your hand, it will run through your fingers. That's running sand. Um, nice picture on the right hand side detailing what running sand can do to an open excavation. Suddenly the bottom of your excavation isn't there anymore. And on the left is one of these uh, is a uh, a cable UTX chamber that got installed at the point we discovered that we had running sand. As I said, they built up the area six to seven meters in some places. Our GI didn't show us that we had running sand, but then we suddenly dug a hole and we suddenly discovered we had it. Now, running sand is not a problem apart from the fact that the track is always in the way because the way you deal with running sand is you put down a nice set of um, uh, a nice set of uh, retaining wall into your ground, knock it in, steal it seals off the water. You don't have running sand running into your excavation. Great, except you've got rails in the way, so that doesn't work all of a sudden. So why is that a problem? Well, what it means is what it means is that suddenly we've now got to worry about how we dig this thing so we've now got so we've got running sand in the left on the left hand side that's why we're micro tunneling that's the problem i mentioned to you before in the middle we've got to get past the cadent gas main and underneath the thick scissors uh, pete Verriard is currently looking at me with utter disgust as i say that because we've got to somehow make it from one place where we can drop an, a chamber to put the launching bike for a tunneling board machine into to another place where we can get it out the other end. There isn't much room on a railway. So this now means we need to go under the track at silly angles. We haven't quite got sign off for this yet, but there isn't really another option. But the problem is, is that what that means is, again, we can't cut and cover. We've got running sand. We the only way that we can deal with it is by taking the track off. And we really don't like taking the track off, because if you've gone walk down Bassford Hall like, independent lines at any point, you'll realize how poor quality the track actually is because the drainage is shot. But because of that, it means every time we touch the track, we find a million faults that we don't have to correct. And then we get pressured from project management. Why are we costing so much? Why are we doing so much of a design? This is the problem. So all of a sudden, it doesn't become cost effective to take the track off, dig a big hole, especially as as much time as we've got on Bassford Hall, which is a lot. We've got all we've got Sunday, Sunday all day. We don't have a lot of time. The other problem is, is the track again is in the way. Water goes where you need to, where it wants to go, pretty much in a gravity fed system. So the problem is, is at the point where you now need to cross the UTX, uh, so this new UTX standard, CIVDO 44, turns around and tells you, you need to be a certain depth below the sleeper. Now that, in principle, fantastic idea, completely on board with it. But drainage jobs will be constantly breaking it because you have to put your pipe in at the depth that it needs to go. And you can work around it where you need to, but if you literally have no other option, we've had to put in about seven derogations already on the UTX standard. Now they are quite understanding with drainage jobs because they know that this happens a lot, but that's reality. And so there you've now got this extra risk that we've now built into the railway. We've potentially put in a hard spot for the maintainers to now have to deal with, or a soft spot. Depends which way it goes. Problem number 12. So I mentioned that there's a lot of pipes. So everyone will be sat there going, so why aren't you using them? Now, that was actually the original target of the project. The original target of the project was go in, refurbish the pipes, except we went in, discovered everything had collapsed, everything wasn't fit to purpose, the stuff that wasn't collapsed was fractured, and none of it was falling at a gradient that would mean anyone could stop it silting up within the year. What do you mean they're fully collapsed and full of concrete? Yes, yeah, so they're fully collapsed and full of concrete, that's CCTV. That's about five, six metres up from one of the infalls to Gresty Brook. And someone five metres down has put concrete in the way. We still don't know why this concrete is here. We're doing a big trial pit at the moment of five metres deep. Yes, ha ha, a trial pit that's five metres deep. That's that's it's it's obscene for a, for a civil's job to be having to do that. But we have to go down to that depth. Why? there's concrete in the way it could be protecting the service we don't know 
we hoped it was an old foundation. We dug down three metres already before we had to curtail the excavation. No type of foundation, which means it probably isn't a foundation. So it means it's one of two things. Either someone poured a foundation in and it's flowed down the pipe, or the worst situation, which is someone's trying to protect something in the ground. We really hope it isn't that one, because if we can't use this outfall, I don't really want to imagine that, if I'm honest with you. So what's that problem? So what does that mean? So we know that we've got two major outfalls that we're trying to use. We know that they come and drain Bassford Hall sidings. We know they were put in by the, by, uh, uh, in the, uh, after 1901. We know that they run approximately on those lines. We can't blast, we can't jet them because they've collapsed at the end. So at the top end next to Bresty Brook, one's collapsed three metres in, the other one's full of concrete. That to make sure I just showed you. And about hundreds, a few hundred metres down, all the rest of it, we tried to jet and we've had to curtail every single time because the water is coming in too fast. Why? Because when you don't have a drainage system that works in a flat area, you have this huge head of water that the moment you suddenly create a nice area for the water to go into will suddenly appear in your pipe. Yay! Anyone wonder why one of the pipes may not be working? Almost well, like in 2016, we built a piled structure over the top of one of them, and we've probably put a pile straight through it. And finally, the last one. At least only some of the pipes are collapsed. Some of them are partially collapsed, like this one. This is our lovely chamber A to A1. And we're going to try and fix this. This is fixable. So what we're doing, actually, literally next week, going in, putting a robot arm into the, into the hole and digging away gradually. Dig, line, dig, line, dig, line, dig, line. And the aim is to get back to 10% original capacity. Now, that's fine, but we had a program to meet. So before we got to be able to do that, that meant we now needed to think about the fact that we were building a functioning drainage system upstream. What happens during the winter? Luckily, we've not had a very wet winter, but if we'd had a very wet winter, that's not functioning at full capacity anymore. We are now relying, well, the new drainage system is now relying on the end of the system working as it's meant to, but it isn't because we haven't fixed it yet. So uh, that's the line of it, by the way. So um, that's what they do with the liner and all the rest of it. So what do we do about it? We put in the temporary works for drainage. No one has ever, I, I don't know anyone that's done that. It's good fun when I got to say those words because actually it should be done a lot more. Temporary works for drainage. Get your water where it needs to go. There are a whole bunch of rules that the EA have about it. Luckily, because all of what we were doing was just feeding straight back into our own system, which we technically already got a permit for, we don't need to worry about that. But we've got this situation where we've now got pumps sat there running through the track, basically taking it from one chamber to another when the weather gets bad enough. Weather hasn't gotten bad enough for us to turn these on, so project manager is probably going to twist my arm and say, why on earth did we put these in? But fundamentally, if we'd had rainfall from about three years ago, these would be on. There'd be no question about it. And we'd be trying to make sure that we didn't have the waste high water again. Because if we're fixing the drainage, the last thing we want is for this place to flood whilst we're fixing it. So what do we take from all of this? As I said, I didn't want this to be just about drainage when I first came up with it. I wanted to talk about a few of the problems that we've had elsewhere, but predominantly all the problems have come down to the fact that we have a very old drainage system that we keep finding everywhere and it's not working and it's all broken. Drainage can't be ignored. The track quality through this section is appalling because it's full of water. We, the whole reason that we have this resignaling scheme has, it starts off as resignaling scheme, the whole reason we have this massive drainage in it is because they didn't want their new stuff to get damaged with water, which I completely understand. I wish we did it more often in other places, because what some other recycling projects have gone and done is just put everything on stilts, which is just putting a really expensive sticking plaster on everything. Second, climate change means we are gone are the days of sticking a pipe in your, found, in your formation and being done with it. You can't do it because you cannot achieve the level of drainage that we need to not flood over the next 10, 20 years. The rain's coming. We had, we've had three years of light rain, yeah. 
but it's coming. You need to consider pollution earlier in the life cycle. One of the problems that we had is the moment we turned around and said we need to put interceptors in is all of a sudden everyone suddenly went, hang on a second, that's going to cost a lot of money. Yes. We're right next to Freightliner. They have got oil everywhere. We can't just dump it into Gresty Brook. Seriously, it needs to be thought about earlier because permits take a long time to get if you need them and they cost some money. You can always get them. It's not like planning permission but they will always set quite a high criteria for what you need to achieve in order to get one, generally. Good relationship with the EA, always be beneficial. Projects need to understand the existing condition of drainage before they start saying, go and fix the drainage. This is again, the same problem that we had in Bassford Hall. Go and fix the drainage. Yeah, sure. It's all broken. What do you mean it's all broken? I don't want it to be all broken. Yeah, but it is. And this is everywhere around the country. The drainage is not necessarily where you think it is and the condition we need it to be in, et cetera. One thing that we had during the project that we don't think actually happened, but we were definitely at risk of causing was that because we jetted through some pipes with hairline fractures that were clay. When we removed the silt, all of a sudden those pipes were didn't have what they were relying on anymore, and it has been known for pipes to then collapse in on themselves not long after you jetted through. So if you are jetting. Do it with some serious thought about how quickly you're coming in after to try and fix it. Always look in the archive. If we'd looked in the archive, we'd have known there were struts in the ground. Buried services don't always show you everything, especially not concrete struts in the ground because they're not technically classed as a buried service. Don't ask. Do as much TBI as possible. Our temporary works has had difficulty because we haven't got an understanding everywhere. We had to come up with a very generic solution. And actually what it meant was that we've had to curtail sometimes because we've dug down and gone. We didn't expect this ground condition. TBI really, really useful to inform a lot of things. And then finally, build what's designed. The 2010, the 2003, the 1960s, all the rest of it, they've all failed probably because they weren't laid right. If you've got flat pipes, they silt, and then you can't maintain them. It's very, very difficult to maintain them at that point, and especially in the world of where we're going with uh, the, the, the tightening of funds and network rail, our maintenance team don't have time or the money to start going out and dealing with the drainage system that sells up. They'll just let it silt. And then we have a whole world of problems. First lecture I ever got at uni was if you don't sort out your drainage, there's no point in building a foundation. If you don't sort out your foundation, there's no point in building a structure. If you don't sort out your structure, there's no point in putting people or, or, or vehicles on it. Water comes first, it should always come first, and it often doesn't. And that's one of the key things I want everyone to take away from today. And I'm sure we already know it, but hey ho, if we keep shouting the mantra, water matters, um, then um, people will think we're very weird. Thank you, everyone. Um, any questions? I know I've run slightly late, but we did start slightly late. No, you're fine. Cheers. Thanks very much for that, David. I've been monitoring the chat as we've been going. I can't see any questions you can't see it there can you oh one second i can turn off the powerpoint so yeah if anyone on the um anyone on the call has got any questions please feel free to either post them in the chat i've just muted by accident yeah, sorry carry on um just have a look in the chat So yeah, if anyone on the call has any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat or, or to put your hand up and you can ask in person. Uh, likewise, if anyone in the room's got any. So it's all thing out the train or it is a precursor to actually doing track renewals and everything else you're going to do as part of the group project. Yes, kind of. So the question was, is the drainage the precursor to everything else? Now, in practice, I would prefer it if we'd done the drainage in tandem with the track renewals that are coming through afterwards, but program dictated the drainage needs to go in in time for the signaling. The signaling was driving the program. We are going, we are currently looking at drainage on the station area. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm the really loud drum turning up and shouting, we need to think about drainage again, and everyone's going, shut up, David, and then having to listen when they realise why. Um, so, the, uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of drainage going on in this area, and we're hoping to try and make it as holistically a thought-out system as possible, because that's what the asset manager and the maintainer want. It's probably worth adding as well that there was very little remit for any B-way works down yeah. here. 
this was predominantly a recycling project, so there's obviously yeah. concern to attract circuitry and um, the robustness of the signaling system. As it happens, we are going to be doing an absolute ton of trap renewals down there as part of live versionary because we're going to be closing the West Coast main line for yeah. months. Um, yeah, and if you had done that, and if we did do the trap renewals at the same time, such as the formation renewals at the same time, the temporary works is less onerous and therefore mm. less costly. You can lay more drainage faster, but you've got to deal with what you've got, what you what you've got to deal with. We we have to we have to get it in in time for the signaling equipment because if they put this new signaling equipment in and we get a bad winter or even just a bad summer, it floods in the summer. This area, yeah. it never gets dry. Um, if 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 we have if we don't put it in in time, then the first thing that's going to come along is we're going to have to come along and then replace all the brand new signaling equipment we just put in. No one wants that because it costs considerably more than the drainage, as much as that may irk me. <laughs> my, my second question is yeah. is oh, both associated with drainage as well, but certainly yeah. signaling. Is is the passive provision being made for HS two coming into crew in all this work that you're doing? So the question was about passive provision for HS2. Yes, our drainage doesn't go far enough south to have an interface with it. We do have Prue South connection coming in. And yes, again, I'm currently banging the drum about it on there. They do have a design. It's It needs development. And the problem that we do have is that actually it's not being thought holistically as part of all the other projects further downhill towards Gresty Brook. That's a different argument that I've got to have at the moment. I've just got to convince people to do the drainage in the first place. Once we've convinced people to do the drainage, that's when I can start going, right, actually, we need to think about this as jointly together and actually start trying to work out how are we getting all the water that's going to arrive at the crew, not that pre south connection, and not overwhelm Gresty Brook, because Gresty Brook's going to get overwhelmed. It's probably worth noting as well um, that program within which fast yeah. independent line recycling sits is a portfolio of about 18 projects seven work packages 18 yeah. 19 and, projects and that is a hs2 and network rail funded portfolio yeah. of projects so when when david mentions southern connection when i mentioned crew port station air renewal yeah. it is all within the same portfolio of projects so that there is a benefit to that end in the fact that we are one engineering team but obviously as I mentioned as well, diversionary works to um, ensure that we can have a line speed increase and tonnage increase across diversionary. These projects aren't necessarily aligned. They're, they're yeah. often way out of kilter. So yeah, and something that we do have a benefit of is that actually everyone is working fairly collaboratively within the engineering team already. So like me and Pete work quite closely together on a daily basis. I know all the engineers from uh, from CRSA and from Siemens. So like we are all fairly closely knit in many regards. So actually it makes these more collaborative decisions much, much easier because we're all sitting on top of each other. No, just to... Yeah. You say the interceptors currently have been sort of uh, bypassed out of this, so they're not, there's no interceptors in the face of the In about a month, there will be an interceptor that has been bypassed. Right, yeah. But the current interceptor is not doing anything which is why yeah. they've allowed us to do it on a temporary basis. We need to go in and put the temp interceptor we want to put in. Yeah, because I've looked at the road right in yes. the last five years. It's been a lot of oil spills in a wall. We don't buy that pool. But it's been a lot clean out. We've lived there all the way. Yeah. We've never known fish in that book. But then um, probably about 15 years ago, they must have got their act together. They, they started being sticklebacks in there. They're dead again now because the, probably every year there's a couple of spills in it. Presumed they're coming yeah. from the railway, you know. Highly likely, what um, that's actually potentially due to a different problem that's not in at my realm, unfortunately, which is to do with that oil spill from 2008. They responded by putting in an oil interceptor. I won't say any more than that because I don't think I'm at liberty to say any more of that. But fundamentally, we do have intercepts in the area. And when we put in ours, I'm looking at the Guy sat next to you who's the CEM. They're going to work, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> so fundamentally, actually, it should work because the EA have given us leeway on these things like sicklebacks, the great news. There's also a interesting set of um, uh, 
crayfish that are very rare that's actually sat slightly further around in Basford Brook. Um, they're aware of all of these things. They're monitoring all of these things and they're giving us leeway because they know we're trying to fix it. Yeah. Um, if we don't fix it, they will be on our backs. Got a question on the chat from yeah. Thomas, who's there on the call. Uh, which Thomas is, Cornelly, yeah. That's it, yeah. So he's asked what has worked best for identifying the existing installations is ground penetrating radar ideal? So GPR, if you get the good stuff, still doesn't work very well. It can work brilliantly, but what the problem you've got is that, you know how I said the ground's changed above a lot? Well, that's happened not just to drainage, but to all the other services. We keep finding 6K6 um, cables everywhere where we weren't expecting them. We're still finding power cables where we weren't expecting them, gas mains where we weren't expecting them, water mains where we weren't expecting them everywhere. And the problem is, is that when you do GPR, it finds everything. So actually, I want to say yes, but in practice, we've often found it doesn't work as well as we want it to and quite often leads off red herrings. Now, again, it's not something that I've stopped trying to push, but I've not pushed it as much because we know it may not be as effective as we want. But we want to try and do it for crew core. But I don't think we're going to find the funding for it. And as it's not actually that effective, I don't think we're going to be able to do it. But that would be nice. It's not very it's through balusters, so you won't shoot with it. It also doesn't work brilliantly through yeah. ballast as well. Um, you can trial holes and then, then apply, I guess, but then it's... You've got to dig lots of trial good. holes, yeah. So, yeah, GPR can work, but it's one of those things where everyone thinks it's a holy grail and then it turns out to just be a normal mug. We've also not got any existing GPR either, which I'm not sure whether the question was looking at that, but the... Uh, Network rails track recording vehicle. So the other problem with our track recording vehicle is that it's actually very, very old GPR now. Mm -hmm. It's nowhere near as good as the modern stuff. Um, but hey ho, it's what we've got. So it's, it's what we have to deal with. Did you hear on the early news today something about, I think it's the government, is going to set up a great scheme to find all the buried things, whatever they are, throughout the country, make a great big maps so that we'll let anybody wants to. No one's kind of the ground, they just die up and they can go and get the problem to solve. So, that is the utilities of yeah. it's not. So the, the question is whether uh, the government have announced uh, that they want to put in the National Buried Service Chartered Survey thing. Now, my understanding is, is that as much as the desire to get everything in the ground known is a great idea, it would take a long time. We've shown why it would take a long time just in this small section of area. In practice, I think what they're trying to do more is actually, which is a good idea, which is try and get everyone's buried service information into one place so that everyone can have access to it. Because the railway less so because we control a lot of our own data. We know what, in theory, what is in our land. If you were a housing developer, you don't know what's there. The whole point in the PSIP becomes far more important at that point, the pre-construction information pack, yeah. I think that's all the questions in the room. I'll just ask a quick one bit. question, yeah. Um, I've been working on the crew, crew program for three years now, and the question that's always been on my mind is the temporary pumping system that's discharging water into the remains of the old knotty cutting, where does that water go? Is it not just recirculating around and around? So, um, our lovely resident track designer, Mr. Fox, has just asked. What's happened? Where does the water at the moment go in that system that I mentioned, the 2010 system where we've got that pump set up? What it does, it goes into the Blue Lagoon, which, as you says, the old knotty cussing for the uh, for the uh, for the rail line that used to go off to Stoke underneath the West Coast main line. Um, yeah, I don't think anything lives in that uh, pool of water. Let's put it that way. And in principle, it would make it would be a very it would be quite a nice uh, soak away except for the fact that we now are, we're in a halite area and I won't start talking about mining now but the um, and bedrock now but fundamentally yeah all it does is get the water from one place to another and it takes time to discharge through so the only time it becomes a problem is when you have sustained heavy rain because when you have sustained heavy rain eventually you've just your water levels just naturally gone up regardless we're sat this whole area is sat on some lovely clay so that's some lovely till. And if for those who don't know, till is basically lots and lots of old smushy stuff that got pressed under glaciers. And the problem with it is because it was under glaciers, they put a lot of pressure in 
and that means that the water pressure in till is greater than the water pressure outside of till. So if I picked up till in my hand and squished it, water would shoot out of it, not just simply pull, pull, fall out of it like you would with the soil in the back garden. So the problem there is that we've actually got water can't go anywhere at the moment. I've got another question. Yeah, can you see it there from James? Yes. What are the dimensions and locations of the under track struts? They are under Bridge 80, which is the Nantwich Road over bridge, on the Liverpools, but and there is one on the Manchesters, and then all the others start about 20 odd metres in front of the tunnels on both sides. So all the tunnels, so uh, structure 82A, B and C, Manchester Tunnel, Independent Up Tunnel, at Liverpool Up Tunnel, Liverpool Down Tunnel, all of them have these struts and the tunnels also have these struts everywhere through them, which is why I'm really, really, really glad we didn't have to fix the drainage in the tunnels. Do you remember the depth? Just they are about uh, one, uh, they're about by 400 mil below sleeper bottom, 400 mil below sleeper bottom. And this is actually one of the key things learnings for everyone is if you go, if you're doing a track design, let's say, in an area where you know there's OLE and you know the bridge wasn't lifted, chances are it was underpinned with a strut. So it's just something that actually we probably could have predicted that this was the case because we know we could work out they hadn't uh, uh, increased the height of the bridge. Um, I know that we, I know, for example, that it definitely got done down at University Station uh, on the bridge just next to University Station. There is there are about three underpinned uh, beams underneath. It's not a civil engineer's first choice, but when other things dictate it, like stations or track design and track alignment and all the rest of it, sometimes you have to. It's the only way to stop the structures falling in on them, falling in on themselves. It supports the cutting side. It right? literally supports yeah. the retaining walls because you've, what you've done is you've cut out the section of soil. It put out the passive grit. Yeah. It's called the passive resistance in geotechnical terms. And basically, what you're trying to do is you've dug out the tome, and it's now going to go. You don't find it in locations where you've got cuttings, for example. What historically would happen is they would just steepen the cutting, which is another bad idea. But if you're doing it now, what you would do is you would start, you would actually just try and lower the cutting or you would start putting in retaining walls in those situations. Because they're in dry living and cement. Yes, basically. Yes. I think that's everything on the call. Any of yours in the room? Yeah, just one more. Go for you it. You mentioned about um, expectation when you've got these excavation up. Yes. Is there anything that you do about that? So. Because we've had our, we've had our slabs all that, but it doesn't seem like there's any, anyone's got any suggestions about fix it. It's a few. Yeah, yeah, no, right. On the, we use MGF Fersey Shore. Uh, yeah, oh, no, yeah, that comes with that, the handrail. That, yeah. that comes with yeah, the touch the handrail. Yeah. So this fits on staff, we also use a drag box and a gate. It just, it, it's a, the two systems are starting to link with each other, yeah. so they just flip on quite simply, really. We're just doing shower stuff, so we don't ever get that stuff. And then there's no natural way of putting this protection. But yeah. people just tell us yeah. So what to do, but without someone's down to do. Yeah. So one of the questions, so the question is is about your it's about your protection in your in your um, excavations. Now, this is quite a complex one, and it's why you need a temporary works designer. Um, under well, we have a whole British standard devoted to temporary works, and actually, for those on the call, there is also a network rail safe by design temporary works guidance document as well, which is really good, and no one knows it exists. So go and read it because it's really good and it explains a lot of things to you. Um, the MGF Vertishore stuff that Richard just mentioned is great for shielding. It is not intended for actually stopping the sides of the excavation falling in. So it can only be used when you've got an excavation that is stable. That's where you need your designer because they need to make that. That's where the designer's expertise comes in to establish what and is and isn't stable. The moment it's not stable, that's when your trench box comes in and that's when you dig and push. That's when you put it on the surface, you dig, put it in, dig, put it in, dig, put it in. It's slower, yes, but it's the only way to make sure that your hole doesn't fall in. Because this has happened across the railway numerous times. It's one of the reasons we have a UTX standard. It's one of the reasons we have the temporary works safe by design guidance at all. 
people have lost their lives in holes because people have gone, we'll dig a hole, put someone in it, and then it's collapsed on them. It's, it doesn't look like, because this is the problem with soil, it doesn't look like it's going to go, and then it, when the moment you realise it's going to go, it's gone, generally, especially if it's clay, if that shear force is overcoming, and the heat, adhesive, uh, adhesive force is overcoming the clay, it goes. It doesn't wait, it doesn't sit there waiting for you to get out of the way, it goes. Sand, you can't use this at all. You need a trench box when you're going into sand. And it really works for yeah, you. Yeah, we have to great scores, and it? Just, yeah. All the sand, we just have uh, like a shield system with, with handrails on. Yeah. And uh, we sort of told to put it in if it looks like it's getting a bit dodgy. Most of the sand we're digging, at 1.2 below rail head, Yes. That's not an issue, really. But we keep getting told we have to put edge protection in, and there's no way of doing it without that box going in and the box slowing so down. So if you're talking about your working from height situation, so you're working from height situation, the way that we've dealt with it is by, in effect, putting your clamp, uh, cl clamping on um, your barriers, and then as you move along, you unclamp the barriers and just move them along. Yeah. Yeah. You just clamp no, them on the rail. Yeah, Someone gave us a, like a harness strap to all the strap to the rail, but you were like six foot up, and you there's a six foot fall, so it wouldn't stop you till you hit the bottom anyhow. <laughs> it's just made you stuck to bloody rail, you couldn't even get out. So one of the things there is that harness systems are useful, but you can't just put a harness on someone and then give them a length of rope that's longer than the fall type thing. A fall from six feet can kill someone, especially if they fall head first. So it's one of those where you have to convince yourself under CDM, not just yourself, but everyone who's well, then going to order you, you, CDM you is going to take. You don't yeah. put box in. Yeah. 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 Well, then you've got no edge protection. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's the same. That's all I'm saying. That yeah. what we've, we've been told off. But yeah. no one tells us how to get around it. That's just a bit We'll talk thing. about this afterwards. Yeah, well, I was just going to. I was just going to say about the step-based approach to the temporary works. Yes. That, that doesn't really affect edge protection. That's more your method of temporary works that you apply, which. I'm yeah. Sure so this isn't a very easily answered question, yeah. and fundamentally, this is where CDM comes in. If you've still got a fall from high risk sat on your site and it's not properly mitigated, however you mitigate it you've broken the law because you've not followed CDM. So it's how are you managing that risk? And so long as you are managing that risk to appropriate levels, you have fulfilled your duties under so CDM. So we go to that sort of budget area. There is a huge grey area. area. All that sort of stuff. And it's annoying because at what point is it a height? At what point is, it, is there a fall from high risk? That isn't defined anywhere because again, it's supposed to come into your judgment for the location and the lo and the task and all the rest of it. The problem we have in the railway is you can't step. A lot of excavations elsewhere, if you have the room, you step it in, into your location. Yeah, but we can, can't come in. And you can't in a six foot, like that, and you yeah. can't in a six foot. So it's that's where your problem comes. So yeah, you've got quite a few ways to do it. And one of the key things to do, so one of the things that MGF have got, and man next to you knows uh, can tell you about it is they they do actually have a they do actually they can actually show you how to do it basically how they think it should be done safely and all the rest of it and actually it involves a lot of harnesses because when you're trying to lower the mgf in, there's nothing stopping you going in with the mgf so actually you clamp yourself to the far rail and then when you lower it in you can't go in with it doesn't actually add very much at that point if you if someone's there gone yep that's tight yep that's tight lower it in done it's a few seconds longer than just trying to lower it in or as i've seen throw it in i am uh, i'm quite keen maybe next year's program in having an actual temporary works on a more generic temporary yeah. works presentation to the section so I really think it's something we need to educate ourselves about in most disciplines on the railway. Yeah. Um, temporary work. Make sure that temporary works. Uh, I'm the yes. Yeah, so I'm the designated individual for Alpha BC for practice, so for crew and Aston. Yeah. So I point to the first coordinator, so I point to the first supervisor. So the our designer for the crew works is Atkins. Got uh, called Andrea Sills as our designers for us. We also use Bath and BT, they've got a lot of work to come through. We can't have anyone, it's Andreas. We have yeah. Bath and BT. No, I worked at CRSA in Preston. Yes. Living crew. But the, the, we just changed that yeah. to be where it's got a store. Yeah. 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 Ye
Well, called John something. I thought, I thought he, he blurted out of here somewhere. Yeah, it's John, John, John Taylor. John Taylor, that's yeah. it. Yeah. He used to be involved. Yeah. 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 That's right. Yeah. I think, shall we take that conversation off, call yeah, the people yeah. online to go? I'll, I'll just hand over to Les now to do a bit of a wrap up. Les? Yes. Um, I've been looking forward to this talk for quite a while now, David, and you certainly didn't disappoint. Um, very informative talk. Um, it's particularly close to my heart because I'm the track design CRE for the crew programme. And so I've been working on the job for about three years now. Um, it's, it's really good to have a talk about a local project and in, in this case, a really big local project. We're literally talking a few hundred miles behind us there. Meters. My, me <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not really a few hundred metres that way is yeah. where all the action's going on. And a few hundred metres that way is where one of your main of your two outfalls is in Gresty Brook. So it couldn't be more local. Um, and also really good to see that you've used the TDS 400 system, which we did, you're right, we did have a talk here last year about that. And it's a very, very new and revolutionary pro product for the railway. And it's good to see that being adopted. What sort of capacity does that have? We have loads of clubs of one sort, you know. The... No, uh, uh, we'll discuss it later because it doesn't quite work the way that you've just asked the question. I remember the, when they did the presentation, they fired um, a firefighter and was at it and it was just disappearing through it. Yeah. But... You can pass the contacts on if you want. Yeah, to you honest, that we've got like, loads of clubs like Christmas and Tunnel that are tested. You just can't get the wall so it's a low spot and there's no beam under it. Right. 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 And that's when it's meant to be used. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I really that, that piqued my interest. That product, I thought it was really good. Um, and one other thing I've learned today, I, I don't know if I, I must have known this at some point. I don't know if you knew this, Chris, that all our water ends up in the Mersey from here. I suppose it's very logical yeah. when you think about it. But yeah, so that I actually had to look that up because oh, right. I wasn't sure whether it ended up in the uh, what's the one next to the, the other side of the world. The D. Yeah, I'm not so sure whether it ended up in the D. I thought it went to the D. Goes to the Weave and then yeah. north which way in. Yeah. Well, she must make it some mercy, doesn't it? It hits the mercy. So right, okay. So um, I'll ask the people who are here in the room to show our gratitude to David in the usual way, and those on the call who want to can unmute their mics, and we'll give him a round of applause. <laughs> I did realise I probably should do a few thanks at the end because I've actually got the designer on, uh, <laughs> and one of the other and one one of his designers to, uh, 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 as well. Uh, so yeah, Mr. Neil Logan and Darren Sloan, thank you for all your hard work on this. Thanks to Richard for his hard work, John Hayes, Les Fox, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everyone there's put in an absolute solid effort on this project so far, and that's only some of the problems that we've had. I hear about your problems on drainage every week because I sit yeah. at MCM, but I didn't know the full scale until I saw that. So I think yes. I'm just going to stick to peace. Some of the problems we've solved, but not all of them. Thanks to uh, thanks to everyone for dialing in as well. I'll uh, call the meeting to a close now. I hope everyone's enjoyed the presentation, um, and yeah, hopefully see you again next week. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, David. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Cheers.